with a number of the providers that are actually struggling financially. Does the ASFA contract and process need to be changed or simplified? Thank you. Um, I, I, I get, Mary, do you, do you have a view? You, you must yeah. be involved in this day in, day out. So uh, I had quite a sobering conversation um, as a result, actually, of these funding band re reviews that are going on at the moment, I spoke to five CEOs and MDs of competitor organisations to mine. And it was sobering and, and kind of a bit of a sense of relief because actually, yeah, there is, there is struggles going on within our sector and when it's tough. Um, I've only recently changed roles. I used to head up the product development function within QA, so I was responsible for developing and designing these programmes. And, and a lot of heart, energy and soul has gone into to developing them and um, changes makes it challenging. I think um, the one thing I would say to add a bit of balance to this is that if, if I have my commercial director sat on here, on here and our compliance director, I know that they would say that the, the contracting is really complicated and really over the top and it's very difficult. I guess my perspective on this is that we are using taxpayers' money, we are government funded, we're using funds to be able to deliver our programmes. It's important that there is a robust way of managing um, that we are being held to account to manage those funds sensibly. I think that that can sometimes get over bureaucratic and I think that timeframes that get introduced around changes can be extremely difficult to manage and very administratively um, costly and that is, is at risk of killing smaller providers um, and, and when we are investing so much in developing new programmes and we are investing heavily in, in working with government on these new standards to have another layer of complexity around that is, is something that's, that's, that can be a struggle. Uh, one of the drivers of all of the changes was simplicity, but I, I look for it at all times and I can't see a lot of simplicity. Uh, Gordon, you must have locally, certainly, you know, different providers who haven't got a contract. Yeah. Do you think it's a barrier? Is it something we should look at? Um, well, I think it's, it's possibly too early to tell, um, but I think the, 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 there are frustrating systemic signs, and I'll just give you two or three examples of that. Um, um, I have always firmly believed that, um, uh, not least because, again, um, <coughs> my constituents say I've got large numbers of small and medium, really small um, enterprises. Um, I've always believed that SMEs can and should play a crucial part in this process. Um, so anything that makes the whole thing more complicated um, uh, and difficult, uh, I think is going to be a drag on that. Um, I think I think there's a couple of, again, again, I'm, I'm sorry to have to go back to, it's not so much process, it's structure. Um, I think there are two things, um, uh, and this relates to other aspects of what's going on, which I referred to earlier, which is the slowness um, of, of things moving from uh, frameworks to standards. I think there are two things that have have happened, basically, or rather not happened. But one of them is one thing that has happened, one of them is one that hasn't happened. Um, the thing that has happened um, is that, and you really have to go back to about three or four years ago, um, when, of course, this whole area was not being handled by the Department for Education, but, but by the then uh, BIS. Now, BIS at the time was subjected, uh, as most departments were, the Department for Education wasn't, um, to a continuing cuts program. And part of that cuts program um, and the, 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 the basically um, hollowed out, I, I hope it's not too dramatic a way of putting it, much of the expertise uh, and significant expertise uh, of middle ranking staff in ESFA and in places like Biz. If I, if I think about Biz Sheffield, which was closed, a whole raft of people, probably in their late 40s, early 50s, left uh, and are now hopefully pursuing slightly more lucrative uh, careers, consulting on the things which they previously administered. Um, but that's, that's just one example. Um, uh, you know, m my information comes from the interface I have with a whole range of employers, with sector members and all the rest of it. And what comes across to me is, they're not saying that people in ESFA um, are useless, and they're not saying um, um, that they're not um, passionate um, or that people in DFE. What they are saying is that they are coming to this with very relatively poor knowledge um, uh, and know-how, if I can put it that way, of the industry. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, and I'm not going to quote examples that have been given to me by name, but, you know, uh, 
extreme frustration by one of our motor uh, uh, largest motor manufacturers in the West Midlands about you know this 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 whole process uh, and so on and so forth. So I think that's one thing. The other thing, of course, is that. Um, how can I put it? Uh, I, I, I know Jerry Bevergood is very keen to, you know, to, to try and establish some clarity in this. We've got a slightly, from the outside point of view, we've got a slightly hokey cokey view um, of and shake it all about of, of what actually the relationship is between DFE, EFS, uh, ESFA, and um, um, the new the new institute now. If you introduce, you know, changes and rafts of things, you would expect to have problems with batting, with, with um, bedding down. But the lack of clarity in those areas, and in some areas, the lack of resource, and certainly resource of experienced people, I think is being very damaging to the process and very damaging to the enthusiasm of employers to partake in it. Uh, and, and I don't see too many faces disagreeing with you. Uh, I mean, the, the fundamental changes of the structure must, have, must take some time to bed down. So that's not been, uh, so I think you raise a, a really important point. Kirsty, you deal with both employers directly and through providers. What, what's your view of the system? And yeah, I mean, very much echoing really what Mary was saying. I mean, I think that my view of this is that, let's be honest, contracting processes should be robust. They're not there to be simple in that sense, but they shouldn't be confusing. And I think the point Gordon's just been making, I think the problem is we've lost some of the relevant DNA from all of that expertise and all of those chops and changes is what's made it confusing, but we should have a robust system. Um, but unfortunately, there's always casualties of that because, of course, what you then do is you lose specialist provision. So, you know, let's be honest, the, the latest system was there as a sledgehammer to crack a nut. It was there to try and weed out some of the providers. And quite frankly, probably there was some need to do that. But, but the, the problem there is in doing that, we've also lost some really good specialist provision. And my fear, uh, as Gordon just said, is we're going to see that time and time again, you know, as the IFATE and we start to think about T levels and the whole process around that. And, so I think some of this is about stabilising where the decisions are made and the expertise that is held at, you know, at Whitehall and in the centre and letting some of that decision making be a little bit more devolved so that local decisions, a bit more trust I think we need in this ecosystem. We need a bit more trust and belief that we're all there to do the right thing. We all care about the brand of apprenticeships. We all want to overtrain and give as many opportunities. So I think we need to help our colleagues in the ESFA and DFE and IFA just have a little bit more trust in that ecosystem but I don't think we should kid ourselves that the contracting process was deliberately designed to flush some of this out and none of us want to go back to train to gain or even earlier any of us who live through our individual learning accounts so there are some war wounds that people are still have them in their memory and we're not finished yet we may have a refresh of the ROAT P uh, the register We've got the non-levy to cope with. So these are big decisions that are being made in real time, which is another one of those reasons why today's debate was important. Um, uh, is there a, an employer's perspective? Uh, uh, you were saying before you deal with quite a number of trained providers. Has, has, has anything in the system stopped you getting on with stuff? Um, no, I don't think so. So we, we do work with a number of different training providers and um, I guess where it gets more complex is when you then want to expand the number and, and obviously that's got the, the admin overhead on ourselves. Um, so we are looking to go down a more managed service provision route. Um, certainly as we're looking at taking on some more niche training providers and also as we circumnavigate around the devolved nations um, and tapping into some of the universities universities in Scotland who get their funding direct from SDS, there is no way that we can have a direct relationship with all the different providers that we do want to utilise. So, so going down a managed service provision is absolutely the right route for us. And I think it is just making sure that employers know where to go when they're looking for a training provider. Um, and also they know the, the history of that training provider, the background, and so they know who they then want to engage with. Yeah, they, uh, I think one of the themes that has come from almost all the responses is that particularly employers struggle with the constant change. Uh, and any, and I've been involved in probably too many apprenticeship reforms, uh, but in all cases, employers say the less change, the better. And of course, everybody puts forward their set of changes and say, yeah, we shouldn't have any more change until after we've changed it just like I want it. So there is a dichotomy there. We all know there's some changes that would 
be good to make. But at some point, you've sort of got to draw a line and say, let's get on and make the system work. I'm not saying that that's the point we've reached, because uh, there's still some major things to come.